Thanksgiving and Christmas are, it's one of my favorite times of the year. Um, when about September hit every year, Grandma and I were always making pumpkin pies and um, we'd, we'd make the occasional pecan pie. My, my <laughs> I can't handle too many pecan pies these days. They're great, but man, <laughs> they're just really sweet. <laughs> um, but, you know, September hit and it was the fall weather. And, you know, and again, growing up in central Illinois, we have this thing called the Spoon River Drive and you, you drive around and, and all of these little towns come alive and all of the, the small town vendors and they have all of their goods out and um, you drive around and see all the fall leaves and we get to Thanksgiving and, and it was always um, the one time a year the entire family got together. It was Grandma, Grandpa, um, Aunt Pam and... Um, my my parents and, and my brother and I and we all just had this this big meal and this feast that, that we would partake in in Thanksgiving and and then the weekend would come up and we would have um, we would have the festival of lights parade on Saturday and we'd put up our tree and I, I'm a I, I'm I'm a strong you don't put up the tree until after Thanksgiving it's a Saturday after Christmas or after Thanksgiving that you put up the tree. And it stays up through New Year's, and you take it down second or third day of, of January. Well, my wife is is one of those. A Christmas could, tree could be up all year long. Um, and yours is, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are some that are. Uh, Rosa would sit here and tell you that hers is up all year long too, <laughs> wrapped in plastic. She says. <laughs> um, I, I I have compromised. Um, you know, when September hits, she's ready to put the tree up. I said not until after Halloween, um, so November 1st is usually when it goes up. I, 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 I'm willing to compromise, um, but I, I really do. I love the Christmas season because of, of what this season, especially now, what this season really, uh, really is intended to do. You know, the time of Advent is one of those times, it's, it is a unique time of year like Lent, right? Lent leading up to Easter and, and Advent leading up to Christmas. And, and it's one of those times a year where, where there is a multi-layered meaning behind the season of Advent. We've gone through here the last few Advents and we have talked about his first coming. We have talked about his second coming. We've talked about both. We've gone behind the scenes and looked at different characters in the uh, and people in the story, I call them characters, they're people, um, you know, but different people um, that we don't normally take a look at. This series that I'm delving into now came about last year. Um, it was a year ago. We were sitting around, um, it was, I don't think it was Thanksgiving night, I think it was Friday night. Was it Thanksgiving night? Okay. So we were sitting around um, at dad's house and the Polar Express was either on or we, we had run across it somehow and, and we were watching the Polar Express. It's one of our family's favorite movies. I, I love the movie and, and it, it really is a, a, a good movie, but this series was born out of watching that movie on that Thanksgiving evening. We're all sitting around watching the movie, and, and we're, oh golly, we're halfway into this movie, and I'm, you know, we're all just kind of sitting back and relaxing, our tummies are full from Thanksgiving, and, and we're all sitting in the living room, and, and everything was fine until a certain line from the movie came up. When that line popped up, I sat up in my seat and said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I said, you need to rewind that and you need to play that again. And we played the clip again. And I could not believe what I had just heard out of a movie that's based on Santa Claus. I, I really, I honestly couldn't believe it. I was in absolute disbelief at what I had just seen in the movie, let me repeat that line that the conductor says. Let me repeat it again. He says, 
But sometimes seeing is believing. And sometimes the most real things in the world are the things we can't see. Wait, what? See, in the movie, The Polar Express, it's, it's a movie about all of these kids that get to ride this train, this, this fictional train that goes around and, and picks them up, that they need to ride the Polar Express for one reason or another. Um, and, and in two weeks, we're going to get to the four kids um, that are the main characters in this movie. And we're going we're gonna to go through the four characters that, that get picked up on this train. So we will get there eventually. But basically, these kids get picked up. And the main character, his problem is belief. He's just getting to the point to where kids usually get, they don't believe in Santa Claus anymore. And he's just, he's got these doubts going on in his mind. So this is the reason he's on the train. And, and he's got these experiences. And, and while walking on the top of the train, um, during his excursions before this point in the movie, he is, um, he actually is, has run across a hobo on the top of the train. And he is this ghostish kind of figure that really isn't, he's a, just like a figment. He's, he's there and then he's not there and he just kind of disappears into the snow and he's gone. And then the conductor comes up here talking about this time that it was his first his first trip, and, and, and it was slick, and he, he fell. He went to grab a hold of one of the irons that's on the top, you know, the, to keep himself from falling off, but it broke. But yet he didn't fall off the train. And both of the kids are like, wait a minute, what? You, you didn't fall off the train? He's like, someone saved you? And he's like, oh, or something. And, she, and of course, the, the, the little girl's like, well, an angel? Well, maybe. Maybe. And of course, this sparks oh, oh, uh, our main character. He's like, well, wait. This sparks his curiosity because he's wondering if it's this hobo that kind of disappears in and out and saved him. Because he just did it not even moments earlier when the, the, the train was tipping over on its side and the little girl was falling. And then the conductor tries to pull her back in, and then the kid's behind him trying to pull him back in. And then the hobo appears and yanks all three of them back on the train. It just happened. And the kid's like, wait a minute, so did, did you see this guy? And the conductor's like, no. No, sir, I did not. But sometimes seeing is believing. And sometimes the most real things in the world are the things we can't see. We just came off of this sermon series on spiritual wars, talking about an unseen reality, talking about a world that, that exists out there that is just beyond our sight and our senses, that is very much real, that is very, very, very much real. And today, we're going to take a lesson from the Polar Express on Christmas and the gospel. The Bible talks about this unseen realm, this unseen reality, as I've titled the sermon today, this unseen reality all over the place. It talks about lesser gods and, and angels. But when we really stop to think about it, what's the biggest part of this that we can't see? God. We can't physically see God standing here in our midst but that doesn't mean that he's not real and that doesn't mean that he's not here because what sometimes the most real things in the world are the things that we can't see I have gotten to the point now that I do not trust my senses I don't trust my eyes, my ears, my, my taste, my hearing. I don't trust them. I am more apt to trust in the things that I can't see more than I am apt to trust in the things that I can't. Or trust in the things that I can't see more than the things that I can. I'll get that out right. You see, even Jesus himself, even Jesus himself talks about this. John 20 is actually where we're going to be. We're going to be here this week, and I'm going to touch on this scripture again next week. 
I'm going to read here. We're going to read verses uh, 19 to 29 here in chapter 20 of the Gospel of John. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'll, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Verse 24, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and I put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus, said, Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands. Reach here with your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. See, in verses 24 and 25, Thomas had doubted what the others were telling him. He did not trust that what they said happened actually happened. He's like, you know what? Unless I'm able to put my finger in the nail holes and unless I'm able to put my, my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe it. Because, like, seriously, how many people have ever come back to life? Like, without having been... You know, Elijah raised a, a, a raised someone from the dead. Um, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, but Jesus rose on His own power. And He's, I'm, I'm not going to really. Who comes back from the dead? Huh? Firstborn of the dead. That's right. That's right. Christ then confronts Thomas on his unbelief. Jesus is really good at that. You see, our world today would love, they, they, they love to sit here and, and tout this beautiful, fuzzy picture of Jesus that's all loving and non-confrontational, um, but I hate to tell you, Jesus that I read about is highly confrontational. <laughs> he, he really does. He's comes and confronts Thomas on the very things that Thomas says he won't actually believe until he is able to do. Jesus comes to him and says, Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand and put it into my sight and do not be unbelieving but believing. He confronts him on his unbelief. What does Thomas do? He doesn't reach his finger in the nail holes and he doesn't stick his hand in the side. His immediate response is, my Lord and my God. Because you have seen, have you believed? He's like, so now because you have seen me, do you now believe? He said, blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. You see, because you have seen, have you believed? You know, Jesus does this all throughout the four Gospels. You know, in his time, his three years, three, three and a half years of ministry, he, he does miracles. He heals people. Um, on the Acts, um, um, they're out speaking in tongues. <laughs> the Pharisees always did what with Jesus? They always were asking him for a sign. So he tells them a parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And in this parable, I believe it to be, 
a truth, a reality, in this parable, Lazarus, or, or the rich man, is trying to, to, to get them to, you know, to Abraham, um, send, you know, we need to send a messenger to my people because they need to believe in, in this. And Abraham, <laughs> he replies to him, what? Even if somebody raises from the dead, they're still not going to believe it. The Pharisees are they were always asking for a sign. Because you have seen this, do you now believe? You see, the Pharisees wanted to see a sign. They wanted, they wanted physical forms of evidence before them, before they would actually believe what the Scriptures had said and, and what Jesus actually did. They, they wanted a sign. Show me, prove to me that you are real. But yet he goes on in the second half of 29 and he says, Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Blessed are they, both past, present, and future. Both people in the past before Christ's time, during Christ's time, the people that actually lived and walked with him and, and had real relationships like we do. And, and even thereafter he resurrects. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Spiritual warfare. The supernatural. What happens in the spiritual realm affects the physical. The birth, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension. We cannot see these events we weren't there we weren't alive but that does not mean that our belief and our faith is just simply subjective we have eyewitness testimony we have eyewitness testimony john is an eyewitness to these events he wrote them down matthew is an eyewitness to these events, Luke and John Mark have gone and investigated these matters, interviewed the witnesses, and they have written their accounts down. We do not have a subjective faith. People have investigated and recorded these things and written them down so that way the future generations can have this. The Holy Spirit can speak through this into our lives. And we get to a point in our faith where we believe the unseen more than we believe the seen. It really has characterized my life over the last few years. You know, the other thing that hasn't happened that we can't see is coming again. It hasn't happened yet. But you know what else we have? We have the words of the prophets. No, not written on the subway walls, but written in a book. <laughs> you caught that reference, yeah. That's a very dark song. It's a very, very dark song. It, it, it honestly speaks to the, to the true human nature. It really does. We have the words of the prophets written in the scriptures. I am more apt to believe the unseen than I am the seen. It's all taken by, fa by faith. It is quite literally unseen reality. It's real. But just because we can't see it doesn't mean that we can't know it's true. We can have an objective faith. And, 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 and I would even argue that what well, starts off as a subjective faith, based, subjective you know, based on feelings and emotions and, and whatnot, you know, that emotional moment when we walk down the aisle, what starts off as a subjective faith moves more objective the more we walk into the spiritual maturity. It becomes that much more real. That's what the Holy Spirit does. 
is this becomes very, very much more our reality than the reality that we have before us. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. You see, when we talk about belief and faith, there is an inherent complete trust that comes with it. It is more than just simply lip service and walking down an aisle. A true objective faith changes and completely upends your worldview. While change is not required, boy, it sure has a tendency to happen. It really does. A true belief and a true faith has a tendency to completely upend your worldview. Upside down. And it results in a life that has fruit as the evidence of their faith. Now, one more thing that I've got to add on top of here is that Thomas gets a very bad rap. He gets labeled as Doubting Thomas all over the place. But let me throw this out to you because Thomas isn't any less of a believer. Just because he doubted, just because Christ confronted him on his doubt, and just because, because he had seen he now believes, doesn't make him any less of a believer. As a matter of fact, he's just as much of a believer. He's one of the, one of the 11, 12 after they add Matthias to their bunch back uh, to replace Judas. Yeah, I do understand skepticism. He's not, he's not any less of a believer. I'm a skeptic. I'm a very hardcore. I, my skepticism has, has literally shifted. It has shifted from the sh being skeptic about the unseen. It is now shifted to becoming, I am a skeptic on what I see. I trust more in the unseen than I do the, the seen. I don't trust what I see. I don't trust what I feel. I don't trust what I, what, what I taste and smell. I don't trust it. <laughs> Christ has a tendency to upend your worldview. You know, he, 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 and that's exactly what he did to Thomas. Thomas, if we projected into the future um, from external writings and such, Thomas ends up in India <laughs> and spreading the gospel over in the East. Typically, that's where they have Thomas ending up. Now, I, I can't say for sure, um, but according to some of, the, or some of the early church fathers, that's the reports that we have is that he went, he went East. You know, it takes faith to believe what you can't see, but read in Scripture, right? But let me also say this. It takes faith to believe what Christ said <laughs> when he was standing right in front of him. It really did. There's a reason that Jesus' hometown wrote him off. Well, this is... This is Yeshua. This is, this, is, this is Miriam and Joseph's boy. We've known him since he was knee-high to a grasshopper. Huh. Boy, he's really just needs to be committed. He's talking silly. He's talking crazy. Not only does it take faith not only does it take faith and a complete trust to believe what we can't see, I would almost argue that it, <laughs> it takes more faith to believe <laughs> that which is staring you in the face. It's no wonder people walked away from Christ. It takes a lot of faith to believe. In prepping for Christmas, as we kind of wrap this on like how in the world is christ after christ resurrected how in the world does this tie into <laughs> how in the world does this tie into christmas you know um well in prepping for christmas here's the truth a savior has come into the world okay we have his recorded we have what is recorded here in the scriptures recorded down for us to, to, to read and, and have as factual um, information as things that happened. 
Again, John, at the end of his book here in the, in the next chapter in 21 says that, uh, uh, verse 25 says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. This is just, this is just a, 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 a drop in the bucket <laughs> of the story and the life of Jesus. When you, when you put all of this together, yeah, I mean, each gospel covers three and a half years, but it's just a drop in the bucket of some of the events that happened while he was there. I mean, he lived everyday life and things just, we don't, we don't even have a, 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 a fraction uh, of some of the things that he did. A Savior has come into the world. God has provided a sacrifice for your sins. But here's the real question. Is he really Lord of your life? We talk about worldview and, and biblical authority. The root problem of, of biblical authority is the fact that Jesus just truly isn't Lord of your life. Yeah, you may believe him as Savior, but, 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 but is he Lord? Is he captain? Is he the general? Is he... Is he almighty God or is he not? Is his word infallible or is it not? Is what he has designed for life the way things should be or is it not? Has God given us freedom to choose? Or not? As we, you know, I, I, when we talk about Advent and prepping for Christmas, in my mind, we can't have prepping for His birth without have you know prepping for His second return. To me, they 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 go hand in hand. When we talk about Advent, we're not just talking about His first coming, but we're talking about His second coming. The first coming is a for me is a, a salvatory. You know, Jesus is the sacrifice for our sins. But when we prep for his, his return, the Savior has, has risen. The Savior has ascended and exists now in heaven in the spiritual realm. And he has taken your sin away. He is coming back. And he's going to bring wrath and judgment with him the next time he comes to the earth. Yeah. The question on the advent of Christ is, are you living in anticipation of his return at any given moment? Because the truth is, is that he could. Any given moment, Christ could come. You know, I was talking with a friend of mine this week and we were talking about evil and good and um, pride and humility and, and, and all of these things. You know, a, a lot of the, the issue with, with, with the mainstream churches is, is that, that we, we preach, you know, or they, you know, preach a works-based gospel, which, you know, and I was part of that crowd. You know, we, we talk about how pride and, you know, pride is the root of all sin and how, you know, the antithesis of pride is, is humility. You know, we discovered this week that the opposite of evil is not good. You see, when, when good is the opposite of evil, it's about works. It's about what we do. The opposite of evil is humility. Because the evil is prideful. Christ was not exalted to the place where he is now. He was not resurrected and ascended because of his good work. No, he wasn't exalted because he fulfilled the law, which he did. He wasn't exalted because he came and did everything that he was supposed to do, which he did. Christ was exalted because he was humble. 
Christ was exalted because he was humble. If anyone had the right to be hung on a cross and get up there and talk about what he had done, it was Jesus Christ. But what did he do? Not a thing. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's directly from Philippians 2, 6 to 8. Christ humbled himself, came as a man, came, subjected himself to the judgment of man, and allowed himself to be crucified. He had every right to get up on that cross and declare that he was innocent. Most innocent man in history. And yet he didn't. Because it's really not about works. Um, it's about realizing it's not about you. It, it's humility. That, that pride really is evil. The pride is the root of it all. But either way you go, sometimes the most real things in the world are the things we can't see. Most of you know this story. Um, back in 2009, I was working with um, that friend of mine, Kirk, this is the, the story of the ceiling falling. I, you know, we, were, we redid the roof, and we took the, um, the shingles off of my mother-in-law's roof, and we redid it and came back inside, and there was a room where the ceiling was, was it was literally, cro it was crooked, and it was, it was getting ready to fall, but it was one of those houses back in the 70s or 80s where they had heat running through the ceiling, and there were wires running all throughout the ceiling. It was the those wires were the only thing holding the ceiling up. It really was. And Kurt and I were in that room, and we were trying to get the ceiling down in sections. You know, he'd cut a 3x3 a three three or 5x5 five five section, and he'd cut that out, and he pulled that down, and he was doing the next section over 5x5. Five five. I'm standing on the opposite side because I didn't want to get hit <laughs> with a 5x5 five five piece of sheetrock that is literally about 3 inches thick. I didn't want to get hit in the head with that. Um, I, I, I'm good. <laughs> so I'm standing on the opposite side of the room, and he, he's like, you know, stand over there. He's like, you know, we need to, you know, not have this fall on you. And he was, had cut the next section out and had, had oh, yanking with all of his might, trying to yank that five by five section out and couldn't get it. And he just, he's like, you know what? He's like, Ryan, I think you need to come up. So he's like, stand back under this, this section we've already cut out. And he's like, stand there. Um, he's like, because I'm not sure this five by five piece is going to come out. He's like, I'm, I'm thinking this whole ceiling is going to come down. He's like, just, you know, it, the whole, he's like, even though I've cut it, the whole ceiling is jerking when I yank this. And it's, it's not budging. He's like, I'm going to have to give it a heave ho in order to get this thing to let loose. And I went over underneath the section that we had already cut out. And I no more than got over here, was standing here like this. Kurt is standing in front of me, and he puts his hands. He barely, I mean, I've seen the man yank on this thing. I mean, he's everything that he's got, 180 pounds of, I'm giving it everything I got, and he couldn't get it. And he barely put his hands on the ceiling, didn't barely touch it, and the entire ceiling came crashing down. You want to know the moment in my life where I started trusting in the things that were unseen? It was that moment. Because by all rights, that thing should have crashed down on my I should be dead. I should not be standing here. I should be dead. The supernatural unseen reality, I am convinced, kept that thing from falling. There was a reason that that ceiling didn't come crashing down that day. Sometimes, here's the big idea, sometimes the most real things in the world 
are the things that we can't see. The biblical equivalent to that, I believe, is taken straight out of John 20, 29b. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. We sat down last last Christmas or last Thanksgiving and watched that movie and we we hit that moment and I sat down, we rewinded it, I, we watched it again, and next week's sermon comes in the very next, not even twenty seconds after this, the next one hit. And it was a bam, 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 bam. I'm like, oh my gosh. Once once God opened my eyes to the truths that were hidden in this movie, I just was flabbergasted. It, it, it just it still is unbelievable that 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 they're hidden in that movie. I just I, you know for the life of it, I can't. <laughs> it's incredible. Next week we're going to talk about doubters. It, it's the scene after you know he's helping him down from the ladder. Sometimes the things in the world the most real things in the world, the things we can't see, they turn and walk into a car and it's full of old derelict toys. And the toys come alive and start accusing our main character of being a doubter. Next week, we're going to talk about doubters. The week after that, we're going to talk about the four kids of Polar Express. We're going to go through each kid and the lesson that we can learn from each one of those kids. One of them is pride. <laughs> Yeah, imagine that, yeah. I think you know who that one is, right? The other one, um, after that, there is um, a, a scene at the end of the movie where um, our main character is getting off of the train and he's getting ready to go back in. And, and this one, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to kind of twist this one around a little bit. Um, but he, he, you know, the conductor looks at the kid and he goes, trains it doesn't matter where they're going the main point is that you just need to get on it <laughs> i was when that one got i was like whoa that's good <laughs> that's good that is the 20th that's going to be kind of a our little sermonette for the um the carol sunday and then christmas eve sunday is the last line from the movie where he talks about, it is a, oh, it's a great scene where he talks about how the bell still rings for him because he believes. And that will be our Christmas Eve serve, uh, service sermon. And that is how we will, um, that's how we're going to get to Christmas. So where are you at? Um, where are you at this Christmas? It, it has been a crazy year. It, it has been upside down. But yet there are, as I said in the offering devotion, there are things that have come out of this there are things that have come out of this that have really shown us our priorities. It really has. And maybe this is, maybe this is the focus this Christmas, and even for those watching at home, um, you know, what, what is the priority here? You know, what, what are the things that really, really, truly matter? Um, you know, I said it earlier, we, we need that human interaction, and, and especially here at, at church, we need, we need to continue to gather together, and, and, and there are, you know, there are ways to do it safely if, if people are worried, and the, I've noticed the more that people get out, the less the fear has a control on people. Um, you know, the, it's, it's the fear, it really is. People are just scared half to death. Um, you know, I, and I, I, I made a Facebook post about this, but, but fear is the best way to keep people under your thumb. Satan knows that. He wants you scared, isolated, hopeless, helpless, and worthless. That's what he wants. He gets you alone, and he's got you. He has got you. Don't be afraid. Oh, gosh, don't be afraid. That's one of them. Besides money, it's probably one of the things he says most. I'd have to do some, do some research and look at it, but he says it a lot. <laughs> do not fear. And throughout the whole Bible, I mean, I mean, just do not be afraid. Okay. <laughs> you know, that doesn't mean that, that a wave of panic doesn't come over. I mean, it happens every once in a while. But 
we know who we can trust in. 